I'm going to introduce to you uh, Dr. Helen Harwood, and she is a senior research fellow at Chatham House, and she uh, works on food and climate policy. And she's also a fellow at Harvard University. And we're waiting for the connection. She's not live present in Amsterdam. She's somewhere in the UK. Uh, there you are. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Ah, Good morning. Loud and clear. <laughs> loud and clear. Um, well, you're going to talk to us about food and the uh, ecological and climate crisis. And I think uh, the title speaks for itself and we'd love to hear more from you. And as we did before with the other speakers, after your talk, there is time for some Q&A. But first, we'd love to hear what you have to say on this topic. So I'm moving out and you're moving in. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. And thanks for joining us today. So I'm going to be talking. Um, oops, go back. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the role of food system transformation in climate and biodiversity plans, giving a sort of big picture overview and then focusing in on a potential policy pathway and one of the solutions that ties those two major issues together from some of the research that I've been involved in. And just to kind of um, warn you in advance, I'm sure you're all very familiar with these issues, but it can get quite depressing. But do bear with it because it gets much more positive towards the end. So first of all, starting with climate change. And it's worth just pointing out that it's not just an environmental issue. So the World Health Organization recognizes climate change as the greatest threat to global health of this century. So we're certainly not just dealing with a single issue here. And the context is that G20 members basically count for the majority of emissions. So there's certainly a relationship there with emissions and wealth. And there's also a relationship with temperature and impacts of climate change. The recent report from the IPCC found that the global temperature is already above one degree above pre-industrial levels, and this is already having negative impacts. They also found that the impacts at one and a half degrees would be greater than they are at current temperatures, but not as bad as if we go to two degrees. And they also found that the impacts would be greater if temperature overshoots one and a half degrees and then returns back down to one and a half degrees at some point this century, which is one of the things that certain um, policy pathways look at. And that's essentially because by doing that, we risk destabilizing some major ecosystems. So for example, here, you can see the yellow circles represent the ecosystems that could be destabilized up to three degrees, which is currently where we're heading. So that includes some major ice sheets and coral reefs. If we go up to beyond three degrees, that brings in those orange circles there, which are some major forest ecosystems as well. That is essentially the temperature that we are also heading to. So the best option within the kind of remit of the Paris Agreement is to adhere to the precautionary principle and the equity component of the Paris Agreement, which requires one and a half degrees with no overshoot. To do this would require a 45% reduction in emissions by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2050. So, of course, the progress report is that emissions are continuing to rise. So this is pre-COVID levels. The current pledges to the Paris Agreement would take us over three degrees of warming. And the chances of meeting the Paris goals could actually be depleted by 2030. So the revision of the pledges, which is basically what every country is uh, pledging to contribute towards meeting the Paris Agreement, is due this November at COP26. And this is really the final opportunity to bring those emissions in line with the Paris goals. So the coming decade in terms of climate change policy is absolutely crucial. And what we need is for countries to increase their ambitions by around fivefold for the one and a half degree goal and threefold for the two degree goal. Emissions need to peak as soon as possible, followed by strong and rapid reductions before 2030 in addition to enhanced longer term commitments. And essentially, if we delay those actions now, we lock ourselves into a greater dependence on un unproven technologies uh, 
later on to remove emissions from the atmosphere. And I'll come back to those unproven technologies shortly. So without tackling food emissions, it would actually be impossible to meet those climate goals. The food system accounts for around a third of all greenhouse gas emissions, and these are on track to roughly double by 2050. A recent analysis found that even if fossil fuel emissions were immediately halted, the current trends in the global food system alone would prevent the one and a half degree target being achieved. And just to go into a little bit more detail, the livestock sector alone could use around half of the emissions budget for limiting to one and a half degrees and around 37% of the two degree budget by 2030. So we can use technology to reduce those emissions somewhat, but this is really insufficient in terms of the reductions needed. So reducing the production and consumption of animal products is unavoidable. And if we were to try and avoid doing that, it would require other sectors to increase their mitigation efforts beyond anything that is planned or realistic. And if we take a look at the greenhouse gas budget, we can really see here that we have less than 10 years of greenhouse gases remaining to before we basically reach one and a half degrees. So there's really no wiggle room in there for any sectors to not play their part. And this becomes even more apparent when we factor in the need to not only reduce emissions steeply on the ground, but actually remove emissions from the atmosphere, substantial amounts must be removed. And just to go into that in a little bit more detail, carbon dioxide removal is essential to limit temperatures to one and a half degrees and probably for two degrees as well. The options currently being explored do require large areas of land and there are additional challenges with some of the high-tech options. So for example, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, which is essentially growing crops, burning them for energy and capturing the emissions before they're released and burying those emissions in uh, emptied geological formations such as gas wells. So as you can imagine, there's, there are numerous challenges with these technologies. They're not yet proven at scale. They may never be proven at scale. And there are also issues with just the sheer amount of land that would be required to produce the crops needed. And actually the only, the only option that we currently have available at the scale needed to be deployed in the timeframe needed is to essentially regrow lost vegetation. So for example, from deforestation to reforestation. Of course, this option itself does require large areas of land. So if we look at land use globally, we absolutely have to start looking at agriculture when we're looking at where this land might come from. So for example, we can see here how that cycle should be over the agriculture box. Agriculture currently accounts for around 50% of global um, habitable land. The majority of that, of course, is used by animal agriculture up to around 80%, here in exchange for around 18% of calorie supply and 37% of global protein supply. So we absolutely need radical action far beyond that currently planned across all sectors, including energy and food. So moving on to biodiversity, I'm going to mainly draw here from a report that we published in February this year. And what we found is that biodiversity loss is accelerating. The last round of global biodiversity targets were not met. Around 25% of species are at risk of extinction and a further 1 million more species face extinction within decades. So a really key thing to know about biodiversity is of course that it's essential for a habitable planet, not just crucial for our food, water and shelter, but also just in terms of maintaining temperature. So for example, right now we exclusively rely on marine and terrestrial ecosystems to remove around 60% of carbon emissions, which essentially creates a habitable temperature. Food systems are the leading driver of biodiversity loss. And a recent analysis found that over a thousand species are projected to lose at least a quarter of their habitats by 2050, which puts them at further risk of extinction. And they also found that business as usual, meat production 
and consumption accelerates this habitat loss the most and threatens over 17,000 species. So one thing we, we did in the report was kind of describe the structure of the food system, which is structured to drive supply and demand. And we call this in the report, the cheaper food paradigm. So essentially this is a series of vicious circles, which overlap and often reinforce each other. So for example, on the outside there, you can see agricultural production leading to climate change and then climate change necessitating the need for more agricultural production due to the impacts of climate change. This, uh, the whole kind of goal is to increase food production at increasingly lower costs, which requires more land to be brought into agricultural use and further intensification of farming methods. And um, one example is that basically this has made grains cheap enough to feed to farmed animals in massive quantities to actually reduce the cost of animal products and make them much more widely consumed. It also incentivizes the supply of low priced calorigens, nutritionally poor foods where, you know, in, in, the, in the world right now, we have around 3 billion um, with one or more manifestations of man malnutrition, which actually costs around three and a half uh, trillion per year. And essentially what this system does is externalizes those costs, the environmental and the health costs onto society. And really externalizing these costs in the name of tackling food poverty really just serves to increase vulnerability of the marginalized over the long term. And really the solution here is to bring people out of poverty and actually increase the costs of those, of the worst foods such as animal products and at the same time actually reduce the cost of the, the kind of the best foods such as fruits and vegetables. So the food system has a range of impacts on biodiversity loss, including uh, habitat loss and land clearance, which is probably the most kind of widely known and obvious one. And there are a range of different impacts. Agriculture is responsible for around 80% of deforestation. Animal agriculture is responsible for around 65% of land use change since 1960 and is linked to around 80% of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. And of course, forests are a natural carbon sink, which we already talked about. And there's a really important link here between climate change and biodiversity as well. So there's also chemical pollution. So for example, um, Nutri um, nitrogen and um, pesticides, fertilizers and pesticides and manure that is applied to land and works its way into waterways and can result in eutrophication of those waterways and dead zones. We also have a prevalence of monocultures, which essentially reduce the um, potential for diversity by limiting the different types of foods and habitats available. And there's also the direct killing of animals. So for example, the removal of uh, predators such as wolves or removal of animals that are thought to be linked to disease such as badgers in the UK. And there's of course the impacts of climate change which could actually result in loss of habitats, wildfires, increased competition for food and water, for example. And animal agriculture has the biggest burden in across all of these impacts we've seen already in exchange for little contribution to the food system in terms of nutrition. And one of the really the main reasons why animal agriculture has this really disproportionate impact is that they, it's a very inefficient way to produce food. So, for example, to produce one calorie of beef requires 37 calories of plants. Pork requires 12 calories of plants, one calorie of chicken requires nine, and eggs and dairy each require six. So a third of all crop calories globally are fed to farmed animals and only around 12% of those come back as human food. So we're actually losing around a third of all calories before that reaches anybody's plate. And a recent analysis found that if we actually reconfigured crop use cropland in the US to optimize for health and environmental impacts, that same area of cropland instead of feeding animals could actually feed 
an additional 350 million people. So moving on to some of the solutions, we identified these three main areas, food, land, and farming in our report. And essentially shifting to plant-based diets would reduce uh, impacts across the board. But in addition to that, we also need to reduce food waste. So currently around a third of all food produced globally is wasted. We need to preserve existing habitat, which means no further expansion of farmland. And we also need to restore some of the habitats that have already been converted to farmland. We need to produce food differently with much lower environmental impacts. And really here, it's the shift to the, the extent to what to how we shift on the plant-based diet towards the plant-based diet end of the diet spectrum that really determines what we can actually do on those other fronts because it's there where we would actually reduce the um, pressure on land and also free up land for other uses. So there are, I'm just going to present here some, a potential policy pathway. So this builds on an article I published in 2018. And then in 2019, we published this call for renewed Paris pledges to transform agriculture. So essentially high and middle income countries, we were asking them to include these four key steps in their revised commitment to the Paris Agreement. So, and this is currently being signed by over 100 scientists globally as well who agree with this uh, proposition. So we have the four key steps, the peak livestock production, set reduction targets, shift to plant-based diets, and restore native ecosystems. So if we look at the peak livestock component, we can see that livestock production has actually increased around threefold in the past 60 years. So the first step is really to peak that production across all species of animals. And the second step is to set reduction targets. So here we could take a greenhouse gas approach and identify the highest emitters, or we could look at it from a land use perspective, or we could look at it in terms of lowest output to input. So if we did take a greenhouse gas perspective, this is what that would look like globally. So first of all, we would focus on beef followed by dairy and then pigs. Obviously, this will differ if we look at it on an individual country basis or even a sort of individual consumer or company or institute basis. So the third step is to shift to sustainable and healthy alternatives using the best available food approach, which essentially replaces livestock products with the best available food that maximizes greenhouse gas reductions, minimizes all of the environmental impacts and maximizes positive health outcomes. So pulses are likely to be very important in this. And also I think it's worth considering how to actually transition, especially societies who are accustomed to a high animal product diet then there may be a role for the sort of plant-based meat analogues in that transition as well. So the final step is to restore lost carbon sinks on land where we could actually restore native vegetation cover to its maximum carbon sequestration potential and also providing benefits to biodiversity, which would of course help to achieve that CO2 removal goal, which we saw in previous slides. And I'd just like to finish with an example of that, which we published in September last year. And essentially we looked at returning permanent pasture land globally and animal feed crop land back to its native ecosystem cover, which in this case was grassland and forest. And that gives us essentially the amount of carbon that current land use in terms of animal agriculture is actually suppressing. That's the carbon opportunity cost. And then we looked at three dietary scenarios, the business as usual, the Eat Lancet diet, which is around a 70% reduction in meat consumption from present levels and a fully plant-based vegan diet. And we looked at this carbon dioxide removal potential of all three of those diets. So essentially we used existing data from the published scientific literature and we 
did four steps in the analysis. First of all, we, we did a spatial distribution of agricultural production. This was permanent pasture lands using the FAO's definition and 175 uh, crops as well. We then uh, reconfigured that crop allocation for food and feed and then calculated the carbon content of vegetation that would essentially regrow if the current land use was abandoned and that takes into account the current carbon in that land already whether that's pasture or cropland and then we looked at those three dietary scenarios again all from published literature and the time frame for this was 30 years to actually get to that carbon sequestration uh, total. So this is what it looks like globally. This is essentially the carbon that is currently being suppressed by pasture lands and animal feed crop lands globally. And you can see there the darkest green is where we would basically have the most dense carbon or vegetation if we were actually going to abandon that land and let it rewild essentially. And this is what it looks like by income. So if we look across high income countries and upper middle income countries, the really interesting thing here is that those two countries actually account for around 70% of all of that carbon sequestration. So if we think back to the correlation with wealth and emissions, and then this um, correlation between potential for carbon se sequestration and country income, there's certainly an awful lot that high income and upper middle income countries could be doing on this front. So here's the dietary scenarios that we looked at. You can see business as usual would actually require more cropland and more pasture land to be brought into production, resulting in a net CO2 release to the atmosphere. The Eat Lancet diet would remove emissions equivalent to around nine years of current global CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. And if we extend that to a fully plant-based vegan diet, that would remove the equivalent of around 16 years worth of CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. So if we look at the combined impacts across climate change in, the, in this scenario, we would have a 70% reduction in non-greenhouse, in non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, so methane and nitrous oxide, in addition to that 16 years worth of CO2 emissions that we've just seen. And the time frame varies as well, so that 70% reduction would be an annual saving from the greenhouse gas budget. There would also be short-term impacts from methane removal, so we could see quite significant impacts on temperature reduction over the next 10 years if methane removal was to be um, actioned uh, immediately. And we, are, we have, in addition to that, the longer-term impacts of the CO2 removal, which I mentioned in this scenario, was a 30-year time frame. In terms of biodiversity, the combined impact, impacts of that global scenario would be a reduced land footprint of food production by around 76% and a reduced eutrophication impact of around 49%. And again, in both of these, it's the shift in production and consumption of animal products, which is the most crucial enabling element to deliver those benefits. And I think it's really worth considering the, the transformative aspect of this shift. So we've, we've seen the numbers and how that might look like on a map, but I think the sort of how we experience um, the world would actually be quite transformative. And there's a really interesting body of literature developing in terms of the well-being benefits of us spending more time in nature. So this is definitely something to bear in mind. And building on that, I think it's really important that we have a vision and sort of a pathway of how to actually achieve that vision. And I just want to share this short clip, which essentially... The only thing the managers did was remove the cattle. And then we just stand back and watch what happens. Aspen and willows are streamside biodiversity indicators. These woody plants connect with the birds. You can hear the understory shrubs and flowers. It's just incredible to see this. When the cattle were here in these meadows, 
the aspen would stay about this tall. They would be eating the small branches and the, and the leaves. All the cattle were removed in 1990, and then we got this incredible flush of aspen here. So we have these young ones that are less than 25 years old. And then, in contrast, we have these very large old ones that are just on their way out. This is about a 70 centimeter diameter aspen tree originated in the 1800s before livestock arrived on Hart Mountain. This one here is 2.2 centimeters diameter. This came in about 10 years ago. We've taken some uh, photographs since the cows have come off and compared those to what the willow looked like with the cows on the refuge. And it's just night and day. Just an incredible flush of willow and aspen all through this streamside area. It's in quite a spectacle to see how nature can recover if it's just left on its own, how it can restore itself. I hope you could see that okay. The sound wasn't brilliant from my side, but I can always post the, the link to it in the chat. So essentially that is um, giving us an idea of what this transformed world would look like under our global scenario with a very specific example there from Oregon, north of California. And just to wrap up really, all I want to say is that these issues are of course incredibly urgent. We need transformative action across all sectors, including food and energy. And we really need that to happen as soon as possible. We need to take a systems approach for this. So, and that essentially by doing that, we, we bring in major opportunities across all sectors of society. Essentially, there's a role for everybody to play in actually achieving this transformed system. And that is all from me. Thanks very much for listening. Those reports that I mentioned that I've been involved in are available and I can share the link with those if anybody is interested. And thanks again. Thank you, Helen. We have time for a few questions if you uh, want to answer some of them. Um, I'm scrolling through my questions here. Um, let me see. Oh yeah, can, can we, I, I don't see where, where this question is from. Can we pr uh, put pressure on governments to apply the precautionary principle to abolish factory farming, not only for the climate crisis, but also for the global health crisis? in terms of risk for future pandemics. This, the question is, can we put pressure on governments to, uh, to apply the precautionary principle? Do you have an answer to that? <laughs> That's my question then, my, in addition. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, the precautionary principle is, is really interesting. I mean, it's been in the, the climate change discourse since around 1992, but it's been very much neglected, I think. It's it's really very rarely mentioned um, when you listen to policymakers or even look at the, the climate change documents. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of scope there to bring that back out. And I did um, make some attempt to do that in an article I published in 2018, where I talked about the importance of the precautionary principle and that really kind of needs to underpin how we approach climate change mitigation as one example of some of the major social problems that we have. And just going back to that example I gave about needing to remove emissions in addition to reducing emissions and really to, to bring in the precautionary principle to that would require doing everything we can, basically everything possible which is of course quite a departure from what we're currently seeing. 
So I can't see any reason why that wouldn't include animal agriculture. And in fact, as I've demonstrated, we certainly need to include animal agriculture as much as possible. And actually this sector has, as we've seen, massive potential to actually contribute to not just the emissions reductions and sticking to those emissions budgets, but actually in terms of freeing up the land that we need to start re removing emissions from the atmosphere, yeah. whether that's reforestation or some other mechanism to do that. So it plays an absolutely massive role in beating those climate goals. And I think the precautionary principle is definitely under sort of valued or under um, used in these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a next question from uh, Turkey, Istanbul. Uh, have you looked, have you also looked in your research into the effect of food transportation between countries and continents? And how much can we uh, reduce the greenhouse effect by promoting consumption, uh, consumption of locally produced food? Or is this outside of your range of your <laughs> investigation? Yeah, I've done some work on that and there's lots of um, literature on that as well. And essentially the conclusion is across all of the literature and the kind of environmental assessments of food starting from production right through to sort of consumer end waste is that the transport element, whether that's kind of imported from uh, different countries, actually accounts for usually less than 10% of the overall environmental impact of a product. So most of the environmental impact of food comes from the actual production side of, of that life cycle. So transport, yeah, definitely important and transport generally is one of the major issues that needs tackling in, in the climate um, mitigation area, but it's in relation to food, it's really the production that has the most impact on um, the overall footprint. So it's really the types of foods that are crucial in, in, that, in how we actually reduce the overall impact of the food system rather than going to kind of local production, for example. If we had the same food system and everything was produced locally, it still wouldn't actually help us mm -hmm. to meet the climate goals. It's really about shifting the types of foods yeah. that are produced. Yes. Yes, that's very clear. Yeah, and in, in addition to that, uh, we, we talk about crops and, and, and plant-based diets. And what is your view on uh, cell-based or cultivated meat? Question from London. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is definitely becoming increasingly sort of on the agenda. Yes. And I think it will continue to do so going forward as we look for ways to produce food with less impacts. Mm -hmm. um, I think the evidence on the environmental impacts is still quite um, limited. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be more evidence on that before we can really say with enough confidence that this is, um, you know, the result, the, the impacts are different in X, Y and Z ways to current production and actually start to put amounts on that as well, which of course might change going forward as um, technological processes themselves become more efficient. So it would definitely be a sort of um, work in progress um, that, that would need to be sort of reassessed going forward. But I think it's just quite difficult to say right now with the limited evidence on the environmental impacts, um, whether that would actually be enough to meet the climate goals needed. Mm. Um, and, and whether what impact that would have on land use if we need to be growing crops as feed, for example. Yeah, I think there's just uh, quite a lot of, of questions in that space. Interesting questions indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question I was uh, asking myself while I was listening to your uh, presentation from Belgium. Uh, what's the impact ratio of the ocean CO2 to uh, absorbing capacity? Uh, compared to CO2 uh, absorbing capacity of land vegetation and can and how can we influence it? I was, th I was thinking of the oceans as well because they are our lungs, huh? uh, basically, yes. 
Yeah, it's so important, really important to bring emotions into this. And um, I think in, in general, we don't talk enough about oceans mm. and their important role in ecosystem regulation and in regulating, in basically maintaining a habitable planet. Mm. So between kind of marine ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems, they remove around 60% of carbon from the atmosphere. So without that, we would actually have a much warmer planet than we currently have. And the other really key point is that right now, these sort of natural eco, these, these natural ecosystems such as marine and terrestrial, such as forests, for example, are the only way that we have to remove carbon from the atmosphere and regulate Earth's temperature. So we don't currently have sort of an alternative technological way to do that on any sort of scale needed. Mm. And I think to, to kind of understand the importance of ecosystems in their sort of uh, entirety and just the range of processes that, that occur within them and how that actually impacts us and creating a habitable planet is really, really crucial, I think, to, to sort of aid that deeper understanding of why these systems are so important to maintain. Yes, thank you. I'm going to a last question, just looking here. Um... Yes, a very nice question, I think. Uh, is there a comprehensive and simple online resource page where you, which you could uh, recommend which, with credible sources on this subject which we could use for our campaigns? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> or, or would you have to think about that? <laughs> yeah, let me have a think about that. It's not something I've come across. Mm -hmm. I know there are some kind of fact sheets and mm -hmm. there are some online calculator tools that I know some organizations have used. Um, but in terms of kind of everything in one place, yeah, it's not mm -hmm. something I've come across. Wow. You wouldn't know of an NGO which m makes the translation from scientific data to what we can use to inform the public, for instance. I think that's the, that's the question. Yeah, I mean, the nearest thing I can think of is a project that I was involved in, which was essentially a greenhouse gas calculator. So you can put in a recipe oh, yes. uh, and all mm -hmm. of the different amounts of food, and it will tell you the greenhouse gas footprint of that recipe and also the equivalent car miles, which is quite a good way to communicate. I think mm -hmm. if you're talking to the general public, for example, and they can relate that to something much more tangible to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you can obviously compare that with sort of a beef lasagna versus a lentil lasagna and all of those um, sort of interesting comparisons that help to demonstrate the impacts. Um, I can definitely share a link to that resource that's publicly oh, yes, available. But in terms of sort of all of the literature and all of the different tools, it's not something I've come across. Thank you. Uh, this was the last question for now. Um, I thank you very much for joining us.